Hello, everyone, and welcome to the With Chinese Characteristics podcast. I'm Natalie. I'm Cherry. Together, we talk about topics with Chinese characteristics, whatever those might be. And today, we're going to talk about the 1997 Chinese. Is it a war movie? It's a historical movie. The war is only about the Opium War. 1997 uh, Chinese movie, The Opium War. More about the Opium Wars. Yay. Yeah, <laughs> it's more about the lead up than yeah. the actual fighting. Yes. Before we kind of go into it, and Sherry has an introduction, I want to talk a little bit about the context of these movies and the context of Century of Shame propaganda um, mm-hmm. as a whole. Define these movies. Well, it's 1990s China. The Communist Party has done a lot of bad things. Communism as an economic system has essentially failed mm-hmm. because they're all liberalizing. The kind of state control and all of these sort of Maoist policies and cultural movements have created a lot of chaos and also have essentially failed um, in the eyes of the people. The government is getting rid of them. So what does the Communist Party have left for its legitimacy? Mm. Well, they look back and they go, who are the only two groups of people who have screwed over China Worse than we have. (laughs) Right? Who can we say? Let's look for an enemy outside. Yes. That's not going to be us. Who's the only two people who could arguably have done worse things than we have? Foreigners and the Japanese. And (laughs) which have always been a topic. I was going to say the Japanese would be on the top of the roster. (laughs) The roster. Which have always been a staple Mm -hmm. of propaganda in, in China since, you know. 1840 yeah yeah <laughs> but it really got knocked into a um an overload post-1990 mm-hmm. because you can no longer really make propaganda about like i don't know something like breaking with old ideas about how we're gonna tear down the bourgeoisie and, and right. do other stuff now right? we're building up the bourgeoisie yeah <laughs> so now it's got to be external threat so this yeah. is a, a short passage from uh, julia lovell's the opium war okay. drugs dreams and the making of china so 1990 is 150 years away from 1840, which was the first opium war. And um, this is what she says, and I quote, The opium war's birthday extravaganza of 1990 was the start of one of the Communist Party's most successful post-Mao ideological campaigns, patriotic education, a crusade designed as the People's Daily explained in 1994 to boost the nation's spirit, enhance its cohesion, foster its self-esteem and sense of pride, consolidate and develop a patriotic united front, and rally the masses' patriotic passions to the great cause of building socialism with Chinese characteristics. <laughs> yeah. The campaign encompassed three big ideas. First, to indoctrinate the Chinese in the idea that, the, that China possessed a unique, glorious, millennia-old national condition, Guoqing, unready for democracy. Good Sec- job. What is that? Good job. Oh, did I pronounce it good? Yeah, also, it just happened... Uh, it's October 1st, so it just... We already just had National Day or yeah, National Week? Coaching, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Second, to, remain, to remind them of their sufferings at the hands of the West. Third, to underline the genius of Communist Party leadership. Uh, in practice, this meant talking up the great achievements of the Chinese people, nation, and Communist Party, and stirring films and feel-good songs, and top 100 lists of heroes, great events and battles, and in numbing references to China's century of humiliation inflicted by foreign imperialism, always beginning with the opening wars, always passing slickly over the CCP's own act of violence. Uh, How can we give our youth patriotic education, said Seeking Truth, Kishi, the party's leading ideological journey, by teaching them to understand the historical inevitability and the correctness of choosing the socialist road, hence the opium war. Yeah. Can I just have a side chat here? The um, alertness of towards propaganda movies like this yeah i feel like it wasn't something that i have developed when i was growing up Hmm. because well you're not a you're not encouraged to think that way of movies and cultural works but b that like for example when we watch the movie uh the movie the hero together Mm -hmm. by john emo and immediately you're like this is a propaganda movie (laughs) (laughs) this is this is to you know this is one china propaganda this is one china propaganda this is you know the the you know the whole argument is that china needs a uh, strong central government and whatever ching shu hong done yeah all these terrible things he's done but we only need to remember he's done one good thing which is to unite to have united china Mm. for the first time and i was like oh my god (laughs) (laughs) never (laughs) you know so 
But like you said, you know, you, you have to, well, not you have to, but to see movies like this one, The Opium War or The Hero, um, under a greater context, historical background, yeah. and seeing why something that has happened many time, many years ago, right, whether it be 2000 or 150, the well, way, it, it's not really about the historical events themselves anymore. Yeah. It's about how you're portraying them today, how you're window dressing it. Yeah. And, yeah. So... The Opium War, Yapian Zhenzheng, is a 1997 Chinese uh, historical epic, some might say light action movie, <laughs> directed <laughs> light. Uh, light, yeah, <laughs> directed by Xie Jing. And this movie, when it came out in 1997, was a big deal. It, uh, you know, won a bunch of awards in China, Golden Rooster, which I thought was Golden Chicken, and you corrected me, a Golden Rooster, and 100 Flowers Award. Well, Rooster is a chicken. It's just a guy chicken. Yes. Well, in Chinese, it just says a golden. It doesn't have a gender. Mm. It's just a chicken. So, and then it also won the 100 Flowers Award by Hua Jiang for Best Picture, which I thought was an ironic name, yeah. <laughs> given how the 100 Flowers campaign went Yeah. Um, not that many years ago from this when this movie came out so the movie tells the story of you know the basically the early stages of the first opium war it doesn't go all the way till the end um but it centers on lin zexu and several other government officials and uh it essentially starts at the time when opium became a problem in china and ends at the early stages of when the war actually happened sure you mean it starts in in 1733 right <laughs> We'll, we'll talk about it. Yeah, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. <laughs> and uh, obviously, the main character, you know, a bunch of British characters, a bunch of Chinese characters, one American character. Yeah. <laughs> one American merchant just yeah. somehow mixed up in there. Um, and, um, you know, Charles Elliott, Lin Zexu, all, you know, make a lot of appearances so it's, it's, in the movie. It's uh, it's definitely closer to like a, like a 1960s or 70s. Mm-hmm epic histo- historical epic than it is to other like 90s historical mov- like war movies it's yeah. there's a huge ensemble cast there's hundreds if not thousands of extras you know they built big scenes um yeah it's it's close to like 55 days in peking or something well the movie had a budget of 15 million u.s dollars which was at the time the most expensive movie produced in China. In China. Mainland well, China. In mainland China, yeah. I mean, so, that'll get you a lot of extras. $15 that will get you a lot of extras, US. right? And I, when we were watching it, we, you know, it really was a big production. Yeah. Um, even by, maybe by today, today's standards. But, you know, it was 90s China. Well, they would, and do it it all with, they would do it all with CG today, so. Oh, true, yeah. Yes. But, you know, it wasn't like Breaking with, with Old Ideas or some <laughs> of the other movies that we have talked about, discussed. Yeah. Um, it was legit, you know, movie lighting, I don't know, movie cin- cinematography. Yeah. Big production at the time. Even though it was not officially released by the state, because it was, a, you know, by a movie company. They made a movie company just for this movie. Um, but it was very strongly supported by the state propaganda machine. Mm-hmm. And um, the time that it came out, 1997, in July, coincided with, well, I think it's June. Well, June, July coincided with when uh, Hong Kong was being returned back to China. So a hundred years of shame over, <laughs> you know, that was, it was, yeah. But, um, so lots of, you know, so it is said to, you know, it is largely believed that it is, um, a celebration or, you know, to marking this event mm. as well. Yeah. So that's the movie. That's the, to start off with it, um, it's kind of hard to find in the u.s i don't know how easy it is i think it's on lots of chinese video streaming sites but those don't have you uh english subtitles well, it's on youtube i know but it's like a really crappy copy on youtube yeah and the well subtitles if you speak are... chinese you're you're or read chinese you're lucky because yeah. there is a chinese version on youtube which is what i watched which is much more high quality yeah resolution wise yeah yeah nali could only watch the, the blurry one <laughs> <laughs> the blurry one with like terrible translations yeah um, we found a few inconsistent translations that was interesting yeah we'll, we'll can we can go through them and we'll talk about it um i guess overall though before we start do you think that people should watch this movie um, if they're interested in that time period uh not if you're interested in that time period if oh, okay. you're interested in 
what the party stance is today or what the nationalist stance is today on that period. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a better endorsement than oh, that. Oh, you are? Okay. Because there, I don't think there's any other movie about the Opium War. So if you want to see it, you want to see... There are a few movies about the Opium War. Well, but are they... I mean, are they... How old are they? Are they like communist well, party? Wasn't there one that we were going to... You know, I said we should watch it, which is 1950s. It's called Lin Zexu. Okay, well, that's going to be like... <laughs> <laughs> not that fun so it might be more fun okay. actually yeah that's true so but if you want to see the opium war you want to see british soldiers running around and and climbing up on things and sure you know, sure and uh cannons with uh um you know i don't know like blanks and then firing and it's it's fun i i think it's good i don't know i feel like on the fun scale like like say wolf warrior is very <laughs> fun this is not that fun well yeah that's because it's, it's your, not that bad either. that's because but... it's your national humiliation okay so. i would recommend it more than 50 days of peking in peking yeah yeah i give it roughly the same at least all the chinese people are chinese that's true yeah also some of the white people some are chinese. <laughs> we'll, go, we'll get into it yeah again. okay yeah. so um so it starts off um i think it's supposed to be 1838 1839 they don't mm -hmm. specifically say but we see um the emperor having letters stamped out to go to uh important people and talk about somebody needs to solve this opium well actually issue. Oh, okay if my i might that's not when it started the movie starts with a declaration of a sentence uh -huh. of a statement do you remember okay no. it, the movie starts with um just a just the sentence on the screen it says yeah. when an uh, an ethnic group slash country can only face squarely and reflect on her once humiliating history when she truly stands up. And I thought that was, you know, they were setting the tone for the movie. Hmm. You didn't remember that? But it was in Chinese. How would I remember that? Well, didn't they have a translation? No, they didn't have a translation. Oh, okay. None of the Chinese Bad translation. translation job. I know. It was very important. Well, it was free on YouTube, so. Yeah, okay. I can't really complain too much. Yes. So this is about a once humiliating history. <laughs> is what that sentence told yeah. me, and that we. But now that China has stood up, we have can, stood up. You can reflect upon it. Yeah. Also, China is a is a woman in this context. Okay. Which is a bigger so is, topic. Is China normally motherland or fatherland? It's it's normally when I was growing up, it's usually motherland. It's like Zhu Guo Mu Qing, you know, like um, my mother, the the home country. Okay. Um, but in recent years, I feel like there is a trend to portray China as a father figure. Hmm. Or the party as a father figure, rather than a mother figure, mm. and that's obviously a bigger topic of you know during war times the country wants a father figure, during peace times maybe the country wants a mother figure. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So basically, we get introduced briefly to um, Lin Zexu, mm -hmm. the hero, so so principled, so uh, self-sacrificing, so dignified, and uh, Kishan, who is looks like a little round fat guy. <laughs> Qishan, Qishan does not look dignified in this movie no. whatsoever. Lin Zexu is so full of integrity. Yeah, and, and Qishan... <laughs> and Qishan is like the opposite of that. They yeah. pick someone who... What did you say when you uh, saw the actor? He, he looks like he'd be typecast as the Japanese collaborator. In the a World Hanjian War II. type typecast. Yeah, in yeah. a World War II movie. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Qishan kind of unfairly gets treated as the guy who, by history, is the guy who was soft on the barbarians. Mm-hmm. But I mean, we'll talk about it. Um, so Lin Zushu gets brought to the emperor. Um, the emperor, um, but before on his way to the capital, he meets his old his old teacher, mm -hmm. and his teacher is like doing opium in a closet. Although he did have a pretty elaborate opium den. It he was did. a room, and it, you know it was, it was a whole den. Yeah, uh, Lin Zushu's teacher. Lin Zushu's teacher is like you know even I this austere scholar who taught you after 60 years of government service, mm -hmm. even I fell prey to opium. Yeah. And uh, you have to be careful if you accept a job from the emperor to get rid of opium because the emperor changes his mind a lot. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's going to work out badly for you. So yeah. spoiler trade, alert. Trade, trade lightly. Yeah, yeah, tread lightly. Then Lin meets the emperor, who I think is the casting of him. He looks... So much like the official portrait of the emperor. <laughs> the Dogon Emperor. The Dogon Emperor. Okay. And he's like, I don't know, I think Dogon Emperor is supposed to be like 50, 50 or 60 at this point. And he looks very, he looks very tired. <laughs> and I feel like he gets treated, the Dogon Emperor gets treated a bit unfairly by history because he's in the driver's seat when this is happening. Yeah. But I mean like. 
How is he getting tr- treated unfairly? He well, didn't do anything for the job. He just got the job. I, I know. <laughs> what, like, and he did a shitty job. I know, but <laughs> I just, just, I just yeah. think the problem is, is that no emperor could have got, done a good job. Well, okay, sure. Situation. Let's feel bad for the for the chosen yeah. celestial for the son emperors. Of heaven. Yeah, for the son of heaven. He's got such a tough job, yeah, Sherry. That's, that's what they lack. His pity. Bring, that's <laughs> <bringing> understanding <laughs> bringing of him. how hard their situation is. <laughs> yeah, bringing their benevolence to all of China, Cherry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the emperor's like, hey, Lin Zushu, you're writing all these letters saying that opium is bad. Yeah. So I want to put you in charge mm-hmm. of getting rid of opium. Yeah. And Lin Zushu's like... <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Sorry, Emperor. <laughs> I'm uh, suddenly very ill, uh-huh. and I can't. Uh, I can't do your opium eradication campaign. Yeah, which is seems to be a common tactic used by government officials at this time. Yeah, you never. Tell or the even emperor, later in the Qin Dynasty, you never tell the emperor no. You just say you're you can't. You're do sick. It, you're sick. Oh, I have a cold. I can't. Yeah. yeah, I can't come to and see you and take up this thankless job. That we all know is going to be thankless. Lin Zishu is honest, but I guess he's not too honest to lie to the emperor about being sick. You know, this movie portrayed Lin Zishu as a very, like, a stand-up man, you know? Yeah. But, like, there's a, a lot of plot points where I'm like, I don't know. Is this supposed to be what an honest person does? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Lin well, yeah. is a little well, sneaky. Yeah. We have this kind of elaborate scene, which I think is meant to, sh- to show the audience. Mm-hmm. The perception of the Daoguang's emperor's personality. Yeah. Where he goes, oh, you're sick, Lin Zishu. Well, I know a little bit about tri- Chinese medicine. <laughs> and so he's like, you know, give me your hand. And he touches Lin Zishu's hand. Yeah. And he goes, oh, you have an irregular pulse. Yeah. I've, I've diagnosed you. Mm-hmm. Emperor Daoguang goes, this is why you're, you're sick and you don't want to take the job. One is you think that um, I won't give you enough power to actually complete the job. <laughs> yeah two is that other government officials are going to get in your way because yeah. they're corrupt mm-hmm. and three is is that uh, i'm going to change my mind yeah you're going to get screwed yeah and he goes i'm not going to do any of those things and of course so therefore you <laughs> must be cured yeah yeah <laughs> and of course all of those things are going to essentially happen yeah um to to Lin Zushu. yeah that was a good little writing i feel like yeah. even though it would by no there is no chance in hell that has ever happened like <laughs> actually in history yeah. but um but i feel like it laid out it laid out the concerns right yes of why lin's issue this honest guy who's yeah. against opium yeah. wouldn't want to take the job yeah okay and then but before we can leave before um lin's issue can accept the emperor drags out the the teacher from earlier who's addicted to opium yeah he looks like he's like 80 he, who's the teacher of lin's issue and the dog on emperor. Yeah, so it's both of their teachers. <laughs> yeah. And the emperor says, you know, oh, well, we're going to execute this guy for being... Make, an op- make an example out of make him. Make an example of him to be an opium addict. And, you know, this will give you, I, I guess... There's no turning back now. No no turning back, I yeah. guess. Yeah. You're going to have to do it for him, which, I, you know, it's an odd logic. Yeah, but- <laughs> you'd think I'd say, if we don't give her to opium, yeah. I'm going to have to kill him. Yeah. Like a hostage, maybe. Right. Yeah. But no. Yeah. But but we're. No. I feel like that's that's for him to show. That's for Dogon Emperor to show how determined he is to get rid of opium. Yeah. And by the way, this is also a fictional plot line. <laughs> this, <laughs> was, this didn't happen. Yeah. Oh. But, why don't you talk about the water bladder? Oh. Okay. Well, so Wen Ling Zushu did visit his um, teacher. Yeah. Just earlier in the plot line, um, he brought this thing called a Qian Nian Shui Dan, which I you know the direct translation is a water bladder. And he says it has been grown under the uh, at bottom of the Dongting Lake, a famous lake in China, um, for a thousand years. <laughs> and I, you know, there is such a thing called Shui Dan, but it's a it's a fossil. It's like if a if a rock forms and there's water, you know, inside of it. Okay. But it does kind of sound like a rock when the emperor throws it on the floor. How are they supposed to eat it then? I, maybe they, of course, anyway, it's supposed to <laughs> cure opium addiction. It's supposed to cure opium addiction. It's, it's this a, medicine yeah. that Lin Zishu brings with him in a little bowl. And he brings it to the emperor and his yep. scholar. And it's like, oh, if only you take this thousand year, this thousand year bladder. Well, it is said that if you eat this, you will be freed of opium smoking addiction immediately. <laughs> and Lin Zushu says, you should try it. Wow. And it's like, wow. Well, how, you know, only, you know, <laughs> why don't we all just do that? <laughs> yeah. Thousand year old water bladder. And the emperor throws it on the floor. 
because he says this yeah. thousand year old bladder can only cure one person, which means he accepts uh, yeah, the I premise. That did he? So did he take it, the gift back and brought it to a doggone emperor? He must have because the emperor <laughs> threw it on the I floor. Because I thought it's very rare. <laughs> I guess they, he, he, he can't have two of them. Yeah. Just, yeah. So he's like, this can only cure one person, but I want to cure all of China of opium. Yeah. And the other thing, though, I want to mention briefly, which I don't know if it was here. Well, can I just? Yeah. The, 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 the existence of this weird little side, you know, thing, the water bladder, yeah. in a supposedly serious propaganda historical movie about humiliation of China is just very odd to me. It's like, are we in fantasy land? But yeah. then again, my problem was Chinese medicine. <laughs> You know, we can sit here for days <laughs> to listen to me rant about it. But yeah, uh, thousand year old blood. And the other thing bladder. they talk about, which I think is setting up the, the plot, is that they talk about how opium has been a scourge for a hundred years, which mm-hmm. is like. No, no, it's true, though. It, it's been illegal for a hundred years. I know it's been years. illegal for a hundred years, but it's really like the mass the mass dumping of it by the East India Company is like, yeah. a, mm-hmm. it's like a 10 or a 20 year old yeah. problem. Yes. Um. But you know they said that it's been a it's been a, a hundred year crisis. Mm-hmm. Um, so Lindsay Shu takes the job. Then we cut to a British opium ship, the Tuna, um, <laughs> where the uh, captain is shooting a seagull, or maybe not. He's not supposed to be the captain, but the merchant. Someone's the shooting a seagull for some reason. Yeah, even though that's supposed to. This bad luck. You're unlucky. not supposed to do that. Yeah, British people know that. Um, I was thinking like, oh, oh British be- sailors know that at least. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I was thinking, oh, to be cast as the the white villain in a Chinese film. <laughs> it must be real fun. Like um, the guy in Wolf Warrior 2. Yeah. Or, Big uh, Daddy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just like just go around and, and have a have a beard and, uh, you know, glare at people. Yeah. So we meet the British sailors moving into or uh, coming in to drop off their opium. Mm-hmm. We see them. uh bribe the local Qing official. We see the opium smuggling ships come up. The the fast ships with all their oars, they pull up to the tuna outside of the harbor, mm-hmm. offload all the opium, and then the tuna goes into the harbor having gotten rid of all its opium. Which is pretty accurate. Yeah, which is exactly how it worked. And then they go into the harbor and do their regular um, commerce. The, um, the legal things they get to trade. We meet um, a couple of side characters. We meet um, Danton's daughter. Mm-hmm. Mary, Mary, yeah, and who dresses up as a guy because she wants to go into Canton. Wasn't fooling anyone. I think. Wasn't fooling anyone. Um, in which again, I mean, but women wasn't allowed. They in. were hundred percent not allowed foreign women. Um, yeah. in Canton, so or in the Canton factories, and then we also meet what's the guy's name? The shipwreck guy. Who? The shipwreck guy. Who's the shipwreck guy? The Taiwanese guy. Oh, he. he what, why is he? What's the shipwreck guy? He's he was shipwrecked. They picked him up. His ship. Oh, shipwreck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, the son of the, yeah, He, um... He Shanxi or He... Let's just call him Little He. Little He? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Little He. his he, father is He Jingrong, yeah. We meet Little He, who yeah. was shipwrecked on mm-hmm. a Chinese ship and picked up by the tuna. Yeah. I mean, he, and he ends up being the son of the most, the richest merchant in Canton. He Jingrong. And he's got some problems because, um, A, he was shipwrecked and coming back with B... He lost his cue somehow. Yeah, he was short sh- hair. He was shaved or something, so he's got like a modern Chinese guy haircut. Yeah, and so he looks very out of place in the movie. Very out of place. He looks yeah. like he just wandered on set or is a time traveler or something. Yeah, but um, he has a cap with a fake cue <laughs> that he wears, and he thinks yeah. that's gonna that's gonna fool everybody. Yeah, also didn't fool. It fools nobody. It, it fools nobody. Yeah. Yeah. They ripped it off as soon as he landed. <laughs> yeah. Off his head. Yeah. So yeah. uh, we meet Deng Tingjin, who's the current governor mm-hmm. of um, of Guangzhou province of Canton. And he's kind of just seen as like a, I don't know, kind of a, just a normal guy mm. who, who starts cracking down because he hears that Lin Zishu is coming and he's worried yeah. that uh, he's going to get in trouble. So then the British sailors land or the British merchants land. Uh, they go to like a tea house, opium den. Mm-hmm brothel combination area yeah i'm not sure why he the red light box. district of guangzhou yeah they bring <laughs> and i i don't think foreigners were allowed there at all i mean maybe if you were the guest of a um of a hong merchant mm-hmm. you were allowed to go but they meet with a hong merchant who i think is supposed to be Ho Kuo or wu bing john is Wu his, bing john, yeah 
who was the richest guy in the world at this point, Mm -hmm. um, who was the head of the Canton merchants, of the Hong merchants. Yeah. um, And the shipwrecked Taiwanese guy. Cherry says he has a Taiwanese accent, so I'm going to Yeah, it's so out of of character, and it's just (laughs) weird to watch it. Yeah. You think it's like an actor's Taiwanese? Yeah, yes. But okay. I just, you know, could we do some a little bit accent work, please? <laughs> <laughs> so the British people sound like British in yeah. this movie, and the American has ha, the merchant had an American accent. Yeah. So it's a common problem, I think. In uh, yeah. In the period movies. In period dramas, yeah. So they all go to the opium den. Mm-hmm. The opium smuggler Danton brings his daughter for some reason. We see there's kind of like a love triangle between. The shipwrecked guy, yeah. This Chinese singer, yeah. And um, kind of a little bit Mary. It, Mary's involved too. I think a little bit. No, I think Mary's father was involved. Okay. I don't think Mary was involved. Well, there's white people involved. Because let's not get too convoluted. We're not get too yeah. convoluted. But yeah. there's there's like love. The Lots romance, of love tension. That's not doesn't really serve much of the purpose. It of doesn't the go plot. anywhere. But maybe they just wanted some romantic plot lines yeah in there, you know maybe they just need some young people in the movie because everybody else is like 55 everyone else is 50 yeah yeah right it's yeah. it's like it's like well the singer does serve an important purpose later yeah in the plot line so well maybe- I'll, I'll i'll talk about that plot because i think later because it's i think it's interesting but um so then we go to um we kind of we learn that this beautiful chinese singer lady is addicted to opium mm-hmm. uh it's like everyone around her everyone around her danton the mercenary captain or the the not the mercenary captain, the <laughs> Danton, the um, merchant captain, mm-hmm. wants to sleep with her. Yeah. So he pays a bunch of money. She's like, oh, no, I don't sleep with foreigners. And he just, he's like, why not? He's like, come on. <laughs> um, you want more money? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then um, there's this sort of strange scene where soldiers raid the opium den. Mm-hmm. And there's all this chaos. And then Mary walks in on her dad trying to sleep with the singer, the Chinese singer. Yeah. And then little Hu comes in also and sees. First, he came in first. Yeah. But, you know, it's just, it's a chaotic situation. Yeah. And he gets mad at her because he thinks she's sleeping with the, the dancing for money. And yeah. anyway. I mean, which she, that's how the, how the that's how, the, that's how the, the profession works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but then he slaps her. Yeah. Like, you, yeah. Anyway, so, but, but, the, but Mary goes in. Mary's, Mary's like, father <laughs> her dad is laying there half naked yeah, her dad's like laying there half the british guy's laying there half naked on like a like a chinese couch yeah so i don't like, know if like that was red, more comedy or, or red whatever curtains everywhere yeah meryl's very um, shocked but the end result is we we see an opium crackdown yeah they're yeah. burning opium pipes in the street yeah which is what happened mm-hmm. little Hu, the taiwanese shipwreck guy <laughs> they rip off his cue yeah and they're like huh yeah. You impos- imposter. You might not be doing opium, but you have the wrong haircut. So yeah. marked for death. Yes. So now Lin's issue arrives. Mm-hmm. So they have this big ceremony of all these people and banners and bells and, and fireworks going off and mm-hmm. all that. And the boat arrives. Mm-hmm. And the only thing that comes off the boat is like a little wrapped, little wrapped box that has the emperor's seal, seal. in it. Yeah. And everybody has to treat the emperor, the seal, like it's Lin's issue. Or emperor himself. Yeah, the emperor himself. So they yeah. all kind of like bow to it, and they put it in a <laughs> little sedan chair, and they yeah. take, and they take it to the, uh, I guess like the governor's mansion, mansion or, whatever, or whatever. Yeah. Because Lin's issue, Cherry. Yeah. He's so hardworking. Yeah. That he didn't come in on the fancy ship. No. He already snuck in. Yeah. And is is gaining intelligence. Yes. I think it's less about hardworking, more about he's like very smart. Yeah. And he's very clean. But he's, you know, he's he's he has a wit. He's gonna. We've talked about. He's this, gonna stir some shit up. We've talked locally. about this before. Yeah. And other things, but like Chinese stories love disguises. I mean, everybody mm-hmm. loves disguises, but Chinese stories especially yeah, yeah, we love, love it. Yeah. <laughs> we love, <laughs> it. love secret identities. And yeah. Disguises. It's all about schemes. Who can have the best scheme? Yeah. It's a yeah. Um. Lisa, she's very was very good at schemes in this movie. Yeah. Well, except for the final scheme. What's the final scheme? Well. We'll get into it. Yeah. Okay. Um. So now there's public executions where they're publicly executing yeah. people involved with the opium trade. Mm-hmm. This is based on a historical event where um, Deng Tingjeng, the, the uh, governor, set up um, executions outside the Canton factories, the mm-hmm. foreign district, yeah. like on the street so they could see it to show that like this is the problems you're causing to China. Yeah. And they're, they're executing Chinese merchants or like... Yes. Yeah, they're not executing 
The British. Or no, they're, foreign not, merchants. they're not executing yeah. foreigners. I feel like this was a good, they have a good set of the Canton factories. You can see like all the little foreign looking buildings mm -hmm. um, juxtaposed. They look pretty real. Yeah, juxtaposed yeah. With, the, with the Chinese ones. Yeah. Um, so um, one of the guys getting executed is, of course, Little Hu, little, hu yeah. little rich boy. While he's getting executed, he's yelling out for um, Danton, for Danton, to help him. Danton, the opium yeah. guy, to help him. Danton doesn't do anything. Mary. Mary does. Yeah. The daughter, she's like, that's my friend. You know, you can't just kill him, whatever. But anyway, what really stops the execution is the singer lady who had gotten slapped by Little Hu. Mm -hmm. She goes and she somehow knows who Lin Zushu is. Mm -hmm. And she tells him like, oh, that's the son of the, you know, the head merchant. And he's not involved in the opium trade. Yeah. And uh, Lin Zushu stops the executions. Yeah. Maybe not just for that reason, but... He stops the execution. So then Lin Zushu asks the shipwreck guy, Little Ho, to be an interpreter mm -hmm. um, because he's like, oh, you know English, right? You understand it. And he's like, do you know how to... Teach me about foreigners. Yeah. yeah. Do you know how to use... Do you know how to make cannons? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do, you know, do you know how to make ships? Yeah. Well, at least he can translate books about cannons or ships if there were any, which was... Th th Lin Zushu did have a translation group. Like yeah. He had like four people working for him in Canton just to translate foreign books and stuff. One thing that gets shown is that Lin Zushu has Little He read a kind of like a policy document mm -hmm. written in English about Lin about Zushu. Lin Zushu. <laughs> yeah, which is probably what's being passed around to all of the Canton mm -hmm. traders of like, yeah. oh, this is who this Lin Zushu guy is. Yeah. And Lin Zushu's like, oh, like, how do they know this much? Do they always know this much information? Yeah. And Little Hu's like, well, you know, and the foreigners, it's like, you know, time is money. Information is money. So they're going to know Who has stuff. the information first who will get more yeah. money. Yeah. And I think that's supposed to represent how early on mm -hmm. it was very one. The information flow was very one way because no, for, no, like you saw in the, we talked about in the Amherst expedition, like no foreigners understood Chinese mm -hmm. and it was only Chinese who spoke English. English. But now like the foreigners understanding of Chinese is probably better than the Chinese understanding of English. Mm -hmm. And so they're reading like and translating internal Qing documents and, yeah. you know, letters and stuff. So me meanwhile, like the, the Qing knowledge of yeah. the English world has not progressed very far. No. In comparison. Yeah. And I, I want to make a d distinction that um, the information flowing, the, the Canto merchants yeah. that are, that deal with, you know, uh, Western merchants, mm -hmm. they probably know about the outside world. A lot. Oh, yeah. And they were for, you know, like, so, but, um, but the, on the government side, they almost refused to learn, anything. learn any information or gain any information or be exposed to any information about the outside world. So there was a difference there. Yeah. And I think it's partially because, you know, the, and this is, you know, something that everyone's favorite uh, guy, uh, Ren Shikai. <laughs> <Ta> <laughs> Ren Shikai, the last Chinese emperor talks about, is like, it's so competitive to pass these civil service examinations mm -hmm. that you don't have time to learn anything else. No. Right? And if you're... And so it's like, if you waste your time learning English or geography... I don't think it was encouraged to learn English, though. I know, but even if you wanted to, uh, okay. then you're not going to pass the exams mm. because you're competing against people who spent that time studying Confucius and writing practice essays. Mm. And so it sort of selects for people in the government yeah. who don't know anything about this stuff because yeah. they've spent their whole life Sounds studying. like an excuse to me. I'm, I'm Bad at school. I'm a Qing, <laughs> Qing uh, Empire Defense League. Okay, so now Lin Zushu, he's in phase two, right? He's arrived, he's gotten his scope, and now he's going to start cracking down on opium. Mm -hmm. So he brings in all the Hong merchants which are the group of merchants who are the only people who are allowed to deal with foreigners. Yeah. He drags them in and they're all wearing like, like, pe <laughs> like, like peasant clothes. <laughs> We've seen some of these merchants in yeah. scenes before and they're, and they're all wearing fancy clothes and you know, they're all living huge houses. They're, yeah. they're probably richer than the government. Yeah. Some of them. And <laughs> when they sit here and kneel down, they all look like everything's just gray. Yeah. Like, like they just came from a coal mine. You know, and I think that's one of those things where it's like, <laughs> there's no good option if you're getting called in for Lin's issue. If you wear something fancy, yeah. he's going to say, how dare you come in here in these fancy clothes? Yeah. But he got mad at them for wearing something shitty too. <laughs> yeah. He's like, how dare you? I know how rich you are. Yeah. You're just, this is just, you know. Yeah. You're just pretending. Yeah. So he's saying, you know, the opium is breaking up families, killing people. 
and taking silver from the great Ching. Mm-hmm. And I feel like the silver is where he slaps the desk because that's the most, uh, yeah, that's the most important. That's what really w- what was about. Yeah. <laughs> so if this guy, if the main guy who is, who is like the, the big, huh, mm-hmm. the leader of, he of Jingrong. yeah. Yeah. If he's supposed to be Hoko, which I'm, which Hoko was the leader of the Canton merchants, mm-hmm. Hoko Wu Bingjun did not do opium. He did not trade opium according to Western accounts. And he wouldn't deal with your company mm. if you traded opium overtly. Mm, okay. So I'm that. curious if this is supposed to be him or not because... Because this guy clearly dealed with opium. Guy, I'm not really sure. But, you know, the, the Canton merchants were like... If he didn't deal opium, how did he become the richest... I mean, you what see how much. De- what did he deal I mean, with? Like tea and tea. silk. Okay, and, he was and, on. He want. He was on the business of exporting. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. Right. I mean, that's, there's a lot of money to be made selling tea right. and silk, and okay, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. So, you know, but that's, you know, he might have done it. I, you know, I haven't. I haven't done extensive Hoko research, but uh, like American merchants would be like, oh yeah, he doesn't like people who deal opium. Mm. Um, so they tell the can the the merchants. You got to go tell the foreigners the jig is up. No more opium. <laughs> yeah. You got to deliver them a letter. Yeah. Mostly. I guess, talk to, to your contacts. Yeah. Talk to your contacts and say no more opium. So they deliver the letter to the British. Mm-hmm. And I guess the Americans are hanging out there too. Yeah. The British and Americans seem like two peas in a pod. They, they do seem like two peas in a pod. Yeah. yeah. The American guy was a lot more casual though for some reason. <laughs> well, the Americans were more casual about it. Yeah. I, I think it was less industrialized. Mm-hmm. Whereas the the British the the British opium smuggling was, I mean it was barely smuggling at this point, but <laughs> yeah, it was just so huge that it was almost like too big to fail. Yeah. So they basically go, oh the jig's up, and the mm-hmm. American guy's like, well easy come easy go, we'll trade something else. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no big deal. Which yeah. was essentially the American, I you know, American stance on this. American stance. Yeah, but not and, for the British. <laughs> no, and the British, so Mary, daughter, is like. Opium's terrible. You can't sell opium. Yeah. And they're like, oh, she's just a girl. Yeah. You know, she's Naive so sentimental. Young woman. Yeah. But we're, we're men and we know we have to sell drugs yeah. <laughs> for Even money. Though queen Victoria is also a young woman at this point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think she only been queen a couple, couple years. years yeah. yeah. It was George the, the, the second mm-hmm. before, right? When they were having all these problems. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so the British decide. No, they have this elaborate voting mechanism where they flip their cups down or up on the table. Which I'm not sure that actually happened in history. It's kind of it's fun, very though. elaborate. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. It's, um, it was almost very Chinese, that way of voting. Yeah. Is that a thing? You put your teacup up? I, it, it's, it, it just, to me, it seems like a scene you could see in like a wuxia movie or something. Yeah. You know? I could see that. Yeah. Um, All the bandits will, you know, or will like drink a, together or, and vote. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, but... Well, they are bandits, Cherry. They are bandits. It's true. They're, <laughs> they're not ban- government officials at this point. No, they're, yeah. they're the bandits. Charles Ali is not here yet. No. So. <laughs> so they tell Hokoa or they tell the elder He, mm-hmm. they're not going to stop. So Lin Zishu blocks up the factories. Mm-hmm. Um, and this part's not really clear because, I mean, maybe the translation was bad. But when I was watching it, it's not really clear at this point exactly what Lin Zishu wants. Mm-hmm. Like, he's not saying, like, give me all of your opium, or is he? He's just saying, like, stop the that, trade. Yeah, he says stop the trade. Okay. Agree to stop the trade. So in reality, this is where he says, I want all the opium of all the ships in the harbor, mm. and you need to stop the trade. Mm. So we get more scenes with Lin Zishu and the uh, little Hu, where he dresses up little Hu in, like, a Western suit with a top hat. mm and makes him eat stuff with a fork and a knife. Mm. So they and can observe go, him. Observe him. Like an anthropology. Yeah. Like, like, <laughs> like an animal project. An animal in the zoo. Yeah. Um, and they go, oh, these, these fork and knife are so inefficient. <laughs> so inefficient, Cherry. Yeah. It was a chopstick. It's one hand. Yeah. Much more versatile. Much more versatile. This is why they're barbarians. Yeah. But also, though, they use metal to eat. So yeah. it must be a it must be a race of people who a barbarian, are barbarian warlike but, people. But warlike people, yeah. Um so one of the priests comes in mm-hmm. from the the factory compound and it's like, Oh, this is inhumane. It's been three days um that they've had no food or water. And in reality I they, think they had food and they water. They had food and water. They had, <laughs> they had they they had a bunch of it that they 
were smuggling in and they had a bunch of it stockpiled. But yeah. he's like, this is inhumane and un- unchristian and unhumanitarian that you're mm-hmm. doing this. And of course, Lin Zishu goes on this. Is opium Christian like? Yeah, this, this, <laughs> this like four minute speech about yeah. how like. How you about know, drug addiction? Yeah, drug addiction. Is that Christian like? Does your God like opium? Yeah. You know, and uh, no, I'll never break the siege, you know. Yeah. While that's going on, mm-hmm. Lin Zishu goes back after the Chinese side of things. So uh, Little Hua gives him a bribe a book, a book with all of the bribes that his father's shipping company had taken mm-hmm. in order for opium. Yeah. And it has like every guy in the entire... Everyone that's on the uh, uh, government payroll. <laughs> yeah, in the entire region. Yeah. Uh, the idea is, I guess he thought like maybe it'll somehow help his dad's case because his dad is also getting... Well, I think it's unclear whether it was a contribution mm. <laughs> or a blackmailing effort, which Lin Zexu definitely read it as a back blackmailing effort. So I'm guessing, you know, like obviously there's bribes for opium, mm-hmm. but also, I mean, there's going to be like Guanxi type gifts, right? Yeah. Where it's like, oh, you know, hey, I got you that, you mm-hmm. know. But Lin Zexu thinks that they give him this list of names mm-hmm. to say that, hey, I've got your dirt. Mm. But maybe Li Lohe was thinking, yeah, yeah, who knows? But you know, yeah, but Li Lohe was thinking, oh, I'm helping you out to, so you can clean house, you know, yeah. if you wanted to. It could be both. Well, so Lin's issues like, oh my God, like every single mm. official in the entire province has done something wrong. Yeah. So he's like, what am I gonna do? I, I got to start somewhere. So he brings in all of the officials mm-hmm. in for quote unquote remediation mm-hmm. and uh, or, or me- me- meditation. <laughs> Where he, there's this big long room, yeah, and uh, everybody's sitting in it in rows, mm-hmm. and the idea is this Lin's issue sitting at the top, and he's like, "We're just gonna sit here and see how long it is before people start going through opium withdrawals." Mm-hmm. The idea is that, like, at least if you know, I can get rid of the people who are actively addicted to opium. Mm-hmm. If uh, they got some bribe, <laughs> sure, whatever. You know, the system's corrupt. Can clear out everyone. I need some people yeah. to work to, I can't to do, work the case. I can't do yeah. it all myself. Yeah. So there's this funny kind of scene where everybody's sitting there. Mm-hmm. Everybody's like trying to drink tea and their hands are shaking and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then if somebody falls over, two guys go. There's this, it, it is, I don't know if this is like a, a Chinese maneuver, but like multiple times in this movie, somebody will go and like two guys will just go and each grab one arm and just and just slide the person out. Yeah, drag them out. I know. And I just, it's just funny because it just Well, like it. do Westerners don't drag people out of a room? Not like that. How do you drag up people out of a room? <laughs> Not like that. <laughs> you 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 carry them? <laughs> I don't know. It's just like, it, yeah, I guess. I don't know. It just seems funny, though. It's like this old guy stands up and falls over, and then two people immediately pull him out like a sack of rice. Yeah. Well, yeah. how else would you do it? I, I didn't even think twice about that. <laughs> uh, it's funny. It's like funny. Um, so in the end, like, it's I too think... too much work to carry someone. <laughs> yeah. They're all fat and, like... Old and... Old and, like, you know... Poofy robes. Uh, yeah. Well, like two or three people fall over from opium withdrawals. Mm-hmm. And then Lin Zishu gets up and he confronts another guy. Yeah. And he's like, you're still pretending. Yeah. And I see through you. Yeah. You're going to fall over any minute. Now. <laughs> 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 I can see you sweating there. And he's like, does anybody here not, has, not, is anybody here not involved with opium trade? No, he's very pissed off at this Yeah. Point. And he's like, he's like, if anybody can honestly say they're not stand up. And I'll give you like my three bows of, I'll give you like my respect. Uh-huh. And uh, like one guy yeah. stands up. <laughs> yeah. I think that one guy is supposed to be Guan Tianpei, like this, um, the this general? general who yeah. is, who was well respected mm. and, you know, but, 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 but the consent, the basic, the, the idea is that everyone in the room, almost everyone <laughs> in the room, they're all <laughs> you know, guilty, guilty of opium addiction Yeah, and bribery. <laughs> And then so he goes to talk to the, I think there's like a few two, of them. two guys who were not involved or yeah. three guys, something I like that. I think it was two because the scene really reminded me of like this, the Three Kingdoms where oh, the <laughs> Liu peach Bei orchard? and Guan Yun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The peach orchard. Um, mm-hmm. So he goes, he's like, okay, you guys, you're going to be my, my two kind of lieutenants and we'll figure this out. Yeah. And then. Well, he actually, he showed them the booklet first. Yeah. The list of names. And yeah. he's like, they faked this trying to fool me. <laughs> but I yeah. see through it. I'm going to burn this so it cannot damage any, you know, any more like government officials. But the, then he turns around and the other two are like very grateful looking. Yeah. And then he turns around. They're like, oh, my God. Like they were trying to say something. Yeah. And Lin Zexu goes, uh-uh, 
no one is perfect. <laughs> except so think, for Lindsay Shue. Yeah, except for Lindsay Shue. <laughs> so I think the indication is that, yes, these people in the room, the yeah. two people in the room, yeah. the supposedly clean ones, they have accepted bribery as well. well but Lindsay Shue has made a, a decision, right? Yeah, you got to draw the line somewhere. Yeah, you got to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, we kind of talked about this a bit in the in the prequel episode of like, the way that the system and the incomes and the taxes had developed Mm -hmm. in order to just pay for everything, keep everything running, you kind of had to take some money outside the system. Yeah. Otherwise you couldn't, you couldn't operate. Mm -hmm. So yeah, everybody kind of was, was guilty. Mm -hmm. So enter Charles Elliott. So Charles Elliott gets done dirty by this movie. (laughs) Yeah, I think so. So Charles Elliott shows up in his naval uniform and his sword which it supposedly was how he showed up during the crisis. And he stomps in to the uh, foreign delegation and he's like, you guys are all dirt bags to all of the opium smugglers. <laughs> he's like, you guys are all dirt bags, but you know, I'm with the government. You're my responsibility. Mm-hmm. So you're going to sign this piece of paper. You're going to give your opium to Lin's issue and the crown is going to reimburse you for it. Mm-hmm. And, and they're like, the crown's not gonna reimburse us. This is, you know, how much money this yeah. is. Yeah. And then, and then later on, Charles Elliott's like, "Yeah, I know they're not gonna reimburse it, but we're gonna start a war. Yeah. And 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 take over China. And it's all it's all my master my plan yeah. as Charles Elliott. Don't worry about it. Which, if you actually read it, what's the opposite? Of what what's he was the opposite? To do? Charles Elliott just kind of panicked. Yeah. And didn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, so. No, they did him dirty. He, they, he's like this evil mastermind. mastermind. Yeah. Very one-dimensional. He has a lot of evil laughs in the yeah. movie as well. <laughs> 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 yeah. Charles Elliott's the evil mastermind who's doing all this stuff, putting everyone through all the struggle, even putting all of the British people through yeah, all yeah, the struggle. Yeah, yeah, the British people, yeah. D- because he wants a war with China. Yeah. F- for no... No reason. No and then reason. the British merchants, they don't want war. No. You know, they want trade. They no. want... Yeah. Yeah. War is bad for business. For yeah. their business, anyway. So they blame Charles Elliott. Yeah. Um, so everyone turns in their opium. Lin's issue sends his gloating letter to the emperor. Mm-hmm. Like, I have. I've done the job. I've done the job. Um, and then um, the British people go out to sea, and we see. Well, actually, they, have, they don't leave yet because we have to have the opium destroying scene, which is. Yeah. I've seen it described in literature probably mm-hmm. a dozen times. I've seen the, um, the uh, kind of like. Uh, mural or, or i guess sculpture mm-hmm. of it in nanjing mm-hmm. in the in the drug oh, eradication the drug museum yeah the yeah. drug eradication museum yeah that we went to mm-hmm. so why don't you talk about the scene cherry because i think it's uh well it's actually so i always thought that opium was burned but obviously well if, not, if you want to have if you want to <laughs> have, have a good, the whole city get hooked on opium yeah that's if, what you would do so he wouldn't do that right if you want to have a good time it's burnt yeah for for everyone Party, party time. So, um, so what they did was that this is the method. Okay, they will confiscate the opium, which was in like round balls of, yeah. of, of the opium goop, I guess. Yeah. And then they would break it down to smaller pieces, and then would break, uh, and then would dump them into these trenches that's mm-hmm. filled with either salt water or ocean, like seawater. Mm-hmm. And then the, uh, the 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 trenches they were lined with salt and lime. They will also put more salt and lime into the water as well. Mm-hmm. And they will mix it up. And um, with the water, with the salt, with the lime, that's going to break the opium down so mm-hmm. that it cannot be re And when you say possessed. lime, you don't mean the fruit. You mean no, the, no, no, the, not the fruit. The, the, the quick word. lime. It's yeah. like, um, it's a base. It makes a solution very basic. Yes. So, um, so yeah, so they stir it. And then um, once a day or every couple of days, they, they, they flush it. Or let it out, let the water out into the ocean, essentially, mm-hmm. so that no one can, you know, again, because they can't just bury it. People will just <laughs> go and get it again. Yeah. They it, can't burn it. The yeah. whole city will get high. And like, apparently, when you burn an opium, uh, the residue will get into the, the, the soil as well. So it's yeah. bad. So um, so the scene that was portrayed in the movie was such a huge production. Well, yeah, you have, I mean, it's... You have like, 20 30 guys was you know laborers yeah was like topless and they um you know they they work in these trenches yeah. and it's all like you know it's lots of like uh, dust around uh, it's a whole production and, and every, everyone's sweaty it's heavy labor yeah and Lin Zexu and all these government officials and like foreign merchants were all observing yeah as if it's a 
Broadway show. Well, I think the observation is important because this stuff is worth so much money mm -hmm. that the temptation to steal some of it or oh, smuggle so it high. out, yeah, 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 instead of instead mm -hmm. of burning it, is like is very high. Yeah, and, and so th this is like a declaration of how serious they are yes that they're actually destroying this and that everybody has to see a pu very public declaration yeah declaration. and you see like fences where all the townspeople are watching yeah do it and it's it's like you're publicly beheading someone or <laughs> yeah. you know in europe you're publicly executing the the catholics you yeah know? like you want to make a show out of it and this process lasted in reality lasted like three days or mm -hmm. so so in the movie i think it you know you also showed that it was a very lengthy process and, and they, it smelled really bad, apparently. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and they the built out that whole set. I, I'm not. Mm. I wonder if that set or that area is part of some anti-opium museum mm, in Guangzhou because it seemed like a very elaborate set to build for yeah a, a two-minute scene. But well, it's, it's a big investment to yeah. the movie, so they could have built it. But what, what you said earlier, though, about like you know the the residue or the smell and stuff, I think it's interesting because it's like it's not a it's a drug problem, right? Yeah. But B, it's like when you get this much opium together, mm -hmm. it's almost like a like an EPA Superfund site. Oh, yeah. It becomes like a chemical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It becomes a chemical like health problem. Yeah. And like you can't just like you you have to get rid of it and dilute it in a way. Yeah. That it's not going to kill everybody. Like you know yeah. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a whole operation. You can't yeah. just dump it out into the ocean in one day. Yeah. You know all the fishes. I don't, People I imagine all the fish there, are going to die, yeah. And people swim down there and get it. Yes, you got to make sure it's really, really destroyed. Yeah. Instead of just sinked into the bottom of the river or something. Yeah. So he did that, and it was very impressive, supposedly. And it showed everyone. It did show everyone that, oh, wow, the government is serious this time. Yeah. Which was rare for the, for the government at the time, I guess. So, yeah, the movie makes it seem like um, it's Elliot's plan all along. Lynn's issue writes a fa the famous letter to Queen Victoria. Mm-hmm which Charles Eliot doesn't take. Yeah. Um, the, the famous letters to Queen Victoria is like, hey, you're the queen. Um, you don't allow opium in, in your, England, country, your yeah. country, which they did. Um, so you shouldn't sell to but ours. But they didn't like it, I think. I mean, what do you mean? If opium smoking was, a, was very po indeed popular in England, they wouldn't have liked it. No, but I mean, it was discriminated against. But yeah, and I, yeah, it wasn't yeah, right? legally like banned. It wasn't banned until much later. Opium eating, opium, yeah, drug taking, yeah, so like thirty years from now, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So anyway, there's the famous letter. Charles Eliot doesn't take it, which I'm yeah, it's pointless anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, which I think he would have. The real Charles Eliot would have. I mean, it was printed in the newspapers in London, so oh, okay, obviously, well, yeah. you know, somebody took it. <laughs> 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 um, that's how we know what it said. Mm. Okay, so then we cut to UK for a bit. We get the debating on the war. We see Palmerston. You know, one interesting thing is about this movie is it cuts to so many different locations. Mm -hmm. that it's like they really needed a lot of extras. Yeah. Right? And they really needed a lot of sets, right? Because oh, they had the, the British Parliament. Yeah. It was a real... <laughs> Yeah. All these people were really dressed in, you know, costumes that were pretty believable, in my opinion. I mean, what do I know? I've never seen a British Parliament yeah, in you action, have. but... In action. I've oh, never I mean, seen it in been, action. We've been to I've, I've been inside of the empty chambers, <laughs> yeah. yes. But it was it was pretty impressive, the sets that built. Also, London looked much nicer than China. <laughs> yeah. All these, like, the, the churches, all these tall buildings and this, yeah. you know, clean streets. Yeah. Well... You know, and I, I think it's it's interesting they did that because it would have been really easy to just to just mention it, to just cut to the British ships hanging out off the coast and going like, oh, do you think they're going to send a fleet or not? And just have the mm. fleet show up. Yeah. But I guess they wanted to have well, They wanted more, that plot line. Yeah. They wanted this to be debated in yeah. the British courts, not the courts, the, the parliament. And they wanted, they had the scene with the um, Queen Victoria and her garden. And like, yeah, you know, and this train station uh, opening ceremony, they did the whole thing. Well, yeah, yeah, okay, but I'll, I'll, you know, it's fine. You, you can watch the movie. I support uh, Natalie for support for recommending <laughs> you the movie. Um, it's watchable. <laughs> so we talk about Palmerston's like, okay, if we want to go to war with China mm -hmm. to get our money back, you know, can we win it? And the British admirals are like, oh well, we've been making maps secretly for the past like forty years. So we have we better have better maps than, than what China. the Qing government would yeah. have themselves. Which is, which is probably true. Mm -hmm. And they had been making maps. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, they're also like, oh, you know, we think that uh, people think that one of our ships can beat 10 Chinese ships. Mm -hmm. And then they go, oh, is that true? And he goes, no, one of our ships can beat every Chinese ship. 
we can we can just destroy their yeah and destroy their, their entire navy yeah um the the the, the british um general in yeah. the scene was very hawkish it was very one time and yeah just this angry <laughs> like arrogant you know like yeah. it's like he is england yeah he's like he, we're, we're gonna destroy them he is the empire yeah so queen victoria gets asked like basically like should we go to war and she's like well you know i'm not a big fan of opium but and it's not about the opium it's not about the money it's not, not even, even about, about the trade. It's not even about the honor of the British Empire. Mm-hmm. It's about it's, it's about, about the, trade. the trade. Yeah, sorry, it is about the trade. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, we need to have free trade because otherwise we are, we're not um, competitive as a concept. <laughs> well, the whole British Empire is built on. Yeah. You know, all these colonies and, and all free these trade, trade routes and flow and of yeah. So which I don't know if that conversation ever was had with Queen Victoria. No. Um, but you know, so she's saying like this is this is about trade. Then we go to Parliament, we get the arguments, mm-hmm. and they go back and forth. Um, I find it funny because there's like there's like the China Defense Squad in British Parliament, <laughs> yeah. And uh, one guy's like, "China is four hundred million people with one emperor and one language for five thousand years." It's like they don't even have one language at the right time now. of the event, right? Or like, right now, yeah. yeah or right now, mm-hmm. they've never had one language. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. even if you count dialects as the same language, it's a very Han centric view. Yes. So, and I'm not sure if they're those people are supposed to be giving the Chinese propaganda line, mm. or they're supposed to be shown as they don't actually know anything about China. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, how's that line supposed to be taken? Do you think? Well, I think it's as a Chinese person, I think it's supposed to be taken as yeah, he's right. Okay. Listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of my assumption too but and, and this goes on to a, a larger part of the i mean mo- would anyone like do you think do you really think mainstream chinese prop- propaganda would say no china does not have one language of course the mainstream chinese propaganda will say yeah it's one country we've always been you know this is not europe we are we are a highly sophisticated <laughs> more you know united nation <laughs> yeah. because which they do say in some lines here like the british you know um the, the, the side that says, no, we don't want to go to war, goes, oh, if China were Europe, it would be hundreds of countries. Yeah, we but they're be. not because they're united and they're like smart. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so that's that is my party line. And it's like, really, they're not united because they're they're uni- united because they're conquered by yeah. mm-hmm. by the Qing Empire. But but yeah, so those are the arguments against war. Yeah. One thing that this movie completely glosses over as, as a side note is. It really does just treat all Chinese people as just Chinese. One, yeah, there, one people. There's no racial difference between, or, or conflict between the Qin Dynasty, yeah, the government, which is of uh, Manchu. Manchurian, and uh, and the Han race. Yeah. So Lin's issue is Han. Kishan is Manchu. Is Manchu. The emperor is Manchu. The people in Canton are going to be mostly Han people. But it's a different. You know, they're they Cantonese. Might be Hong Kong yeah, they, yeah, they're Cantonese people. Right? They're, yeah. So it's it's different, but none of that is even Cantonese mentioned. people are Hong people? I know, but it's there are regional differences between oh, yes. these areas, right? Yes. So, but but the, the, the point is that the movie addresses none of that. None of that. Zero. And in reality, the British knew all that, and they were counting on it. Mm-hmm. Of oh, that. they really took advantage of it. Yeah. In a way. At the end... Danton comes in with this long, elaborate metaphor, mm-hmm. the opium smuggler. He brings out these three vases, and he brings out like a 2,000-year-old bronze vase. Mm-hmm. And he's like, this is a 2,000-year-old China. And it was strong and like warlike and, and, and powerful. Mm-hmm. And then uh, he brings out a Tang Dynasty vase, which is a single piece of jade. And he's mm-hmm. like, this is the Tang Dynasty. And it's the height of Chinese beautiful and elegant yeah. and artisan yeah. and then he pulls out a, a, a ming or not a ming vase a ching vase and he's like this is ching china he's like and it's shit and he dumps it's it on porcelain the i think yeah. yeah and he just sweeps it off the on, off the table and yeah. he goes like with one touch yeah it will break into millions of pieces and he smashes it on the floor i know when i saw him bringing out the vase, i was like they have to break it yeah there will be a <laughs> you know and the implication is for i think the viewer is it's like oh China is great, but the, the, the Qing dynasty has failed it by Yeah, there, by was, being a, there weak. was an arc in history yes. where, you know, the Tang dynasty is what we should be proud of, what we should go back and make China great again. And, you know, so, but the Qing dynasty, this was only a blip in history. Yeah. Which we got to, we, we have to learn from it, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that's not who we really are. So that is what apparently convinces everybody to go to <laughs> war. 
Yeah. Um, the and vase being broken into a thousand pieces. Yeah, vase being broken. Yeah. And um, in reality, it wasn't an opium smuggler. It was George Staunton who mm-hmm. really convinced everybody who was the 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 tr- the chair of trade of the East India Company. Yeah. He was. He translated the, the Qing law codes. He had met the. He'd met the. He the ideally Qinlong would Emperor. have explained China in a much more yeah real way than bringing out three different artifacts and break one of them <laughs> to convince to make his case. Yeah, so that I think that would have maybe just been too complicated um, <laughs> yeah. for them to show, but they it made boring. it boring. But it was. I think it's interesting the fact that they they made it an opium smuggler mm-hmm. to, again to make it seem more about opium than it probably mm-hmm. was. Yeah. Um. So and it wasn't ca- a very close uh, vote. It was a in very reality. Clo- it was a very close vote. Mm-hmm. Um. Because, you know, the the opium smuggling portion of it, obviously there was a lot of money involved with it, but it was a lot of money involved in a very few number of people and companies. Yeah. And what was more important to Parliament were like all the factory workers and all of the other the factory owners and the votes and the money and the tea and the porcelain and like the, the price of tea tripling mm-hmm. because there's a war with China. Oh, we'll destroy the it's British gonna, economy. Well, yeah, it's yeah. going to be a lot more damaging to people's political careers than yeah. opium getting taken out of smuggling, mm-hmm. right? So yeah. um, so lots of people didn't want to go to war. No, and it really took George Staunton and some other people going like, look, I mean, our entire, this entire empire is essentially based on fear and respect. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> if and so, if and, China can push us around. Then so can India, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So, um so we had, so uh, we we cut back to the little fleet. Every all the British merchants are out there outside of the coast of China, being grumpy mm-hmm. and like Charles Elliot, you screwed us over. Yeah, you set us up for this. You're the devil, Charles Elliot. Yeah, a priest says. Um, but then the fleet shows up. Mm-hmm. Everybody's happy again. So we cut to Lin Zishu. Yeah, who's uh, playing chess in a little podium. Yeah, really. having a nice afternoon. Yeah, having done a great job, enjoying life. <laughs> yeah. And then he gets the messenger that the British have sent a war fleet and it's not attacking Guangzhou. Or yeah, but it's backing away from the coast. And going up north towards... Yeah. Well, no, he was like, oh, where are they going if they're backing away from the coast? They're like, oh, I think they're looks like they're going up north. And he's like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> he like He's so shocked. He break the, uh, the he, he knocks over the... Um, the chessboard? The chessboard. And then he goes, ah. Oh. Like, you can just see. He's like, I screwed up. The emperor is going to be so mad at me. <laughs> yeah. And it's not it's not just that the fleet's there. He's yeah. like, if it was coming here to, mm-hmm. to Canton, to Guangzhou, that's one thing. Yeah. But it's going up to bother the emperor. Yeah, it's going to be at the emperor's doorstep. And they're going to go talk to the emperor. Yeah. And I have no way of... Controlling the narrative. C- controlling the narrative or impacting that. Well, I think it's less... I don't know if he went... He thought that far. Yeah. It's more like the emperor's going to have to defend the you know yeah. the, the the fire burned up north and he's here like <laughs> playing chess playing chess <laughs> of course he knows the emperor is going to be so pissed off yeah and the emperor was the emperor was so mad <laughs> so so then the uh the fleet takes Joshan, mm-hmm. which is the little island um and uh, the Qing commander gives this brave speech to them of like Oh, the Qing Empire will never surrender to the British. Yeah. A thousand years. But supposedly what he really said was, well, if I surrender, the emperor will kill me for sure. But if I fight, like, hey, you never know. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So they fought. He fought and he got killed. Um, There's this battle scene where the British soldiers are storming the beaches and getting stabbed and blowing things up in cannon. But supposedly in reality, after the British fleet sunk the Chinese fleet, all the Chinese soldiers just ran, ran away, away yeah. and the governor drowned himself in a pond. Yeah. Um, but uh, so we cut back to Lin's issue briefly and mm-hmm. they're like, oh, Lin's issue, like all these forts have fallen. Yeah. And it's like, oh my God, I'm in so much trouble. Yeah. Um, so now the barbarians are at the gates. Yeah. Uh, we meet Kishan again, mm-hmm. little round Kishan. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Kishan's like, it's terrible. Their, hor- their their ships are so fast. Their cannons are so powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, There's no chance of us defending ourselves. And here's this letter of what they want. Mm-hmm. So we have this imperial audience scene with all of the Manchu ministers mm-hmm. um, and uh, Emperor Dal going up there looking very annoyed. <laughs> so first he reads the letter yeah. that, that Charles Elliot has sent him. Yeah. And he's like, who are these 
these British to send me like a diplomatic letter instead of like a letter of like submission or something. He said, uh, okay, I don't know where it went. Oh. But he was like, England is such a tiny island. They don't even deserve to be our vassal state. How dare they? Because the, I think in the letter, they said, like, this is a trade issue between country and country. Yeah. And that really pissed him off. He's like, country and country. I'm a country. The Middle Kingdom is a country. You're shit. You're not. You're, you, don't, you don't even get to be my vassal state. Yeah. <laughs> How dare you address me? So, yeah. That was and, a big speech he made. And then, then they all talk about it. And it's like, oh, it's all Lin Zushu's fault. <laughs> Lin's Lin issue is getting all the all the blame. Yeah, they blame Lin's issue and they go back and forth and eventually they decide, okay, we'll do is they they seem to blame Lin's issue. We'll fire Lin's issue. Mm -hmm. And then they shouldn't have any reason to fight with us anymore. Yeah, as if that's how it works. That's how it works. So, they send Kishan down to take over Lin's issue's job. Mm -hmm. Kishan goes down to uh, Canton to Guangzhou, meets with Lin's issue. Mhm. Mm and they kind of have an art. They kind of have a round table on mm -hmm. what to do. So I think actually at this period, I mean, Lin's issue was completely out of the picture once Keyshawn went there. But in this, yeah. it's kind of a it's kind of a think tank. <laughs> <laughs> she does see think tank. Yeah, yeah. Lin's issue hangs around. Yeah. And so Lin's issue is like, oh, we got to fight. We got to struggle. And Keyshawn's like, well, you were wrong before, <laughs> Lin's issue, where you didn't think they were gonna fight, and now we're in a war, and how do you know you're not wrong again? And mm -hmm. Linjus is like, no, no, I'm right this time. <laughs> yeah. But, but Shishan really, uh, Shishan, he really lays it out though. Yeah. He's like, their technology, their war technology, it's just better. Yeah. Right? They're just, we don't have the cannons. We don't have the people. Yeah. Like, this is the end of, he's like, I'm going to get, you know, get into trouble for saying this, but this is the end of the <laughs> Qing Dynasty. <laughs> Which would be a thing that you, you would say if you're yeah. prepared to lose your head. But yeah. I think the idea was it was for the audience. And I think they actually don't treat Keyshawn that badly. They don't no? treat they treat him as like he's doing his best. Yeah. So Keyshawn's like, our only way out of this is we gotta get him to stop. Yeah. We gotta negotiate something because yeah. we can't we gotta beat give them. them something. We can't yeah. beat them in a battle. Yeah. Um Which was is not a popular opinion nowadays, I no. feel like. Yeah. But I mean, you want what, Lin heartline approach. Yeah. You want to you want to die rather than surrender. Well, the Chi Shan is like, no, no, let's just let's just live and <laughs> surrender. <laughs> let's just give them an island. Yeah, let's talk it out. Yeah. So Kishan goes to talk to them um, and they're eating steak. And he's like, oh, these foreigners, <laughs> they're so warlike eating these these beef. Yeah, he, he cuts these, the steak and he's like, this is raw. <laughs> yeah. Eating these bloody steaks with these metal yeah. knives. Yeah. Um, so savage. So savage. So Charles Elliott and uh, the the admiral, mm -hmm. he's supposed to be this guy called Brenner, mm -hmm. lay out the demands, and they're like, "We want this money. We want um, the island. We want the Hong islands. Kong. We want um, trade ports. You know, mm -hmm. et cetera, five et trade ports. Yeah, et cetera, et cetera." Mm -hmm. And um, Keyshawn's like, "Well, I'll give you money, but the Qing Dynasty has never ceded its territory." Mm -hmm. And they're like, "Well, it's about to." <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, in the end, Keyshawn's like, "Okay, fine." I'll give you Hong Kong. I'll give you this stuff, but I got I got to talk to the emperor. Mm -hmm. um, takes a long time for, for takes takes a long time for the words to get go up there. Yeah, yeah. So Kishan sends ladies and food and stuff as entertainment. Yeah, ladies. While, while and they wait, and, stuff. and one of those ladies is Ronger, which is the Ronger, yeah. which is the singer from earlier. Yeah, the girlfriend yeah. of uh, of uh, little little He. Yeah, yeah. And Charles Elliot, for some reason, tells her, he's like, oh, this is all my master plan. Yeah. I'm an evil villain. <laughs> <laughs> Inserting <laughs> evil laugh here. Yeah. Um, and then she tries to kill him. Yeah. She was sent as a... Assassin. Assassin. Yeah. Then they send her back. They're yeah. like, she tried to kill me. Yeah. And they kill her. And then Keyshawn has to kill her. Yeah. To not violate the peace. So mm. this is weird for a couple of reasons. Because A, <laughs> yeah. in reality, Charles Elliot was shipwrecked, as we talked about. Yeah. And lots of Chinese people helped him. Yeah. Get back to the British fleet. Yeah, the merchants didn't hate him. No, the merchants didn't hate him. And also, um, uh, I think it's maybe supposed to kind of represent the San Yuan Li incident a little bit of like how the common people of China mm -hmm. were fighting, but it doesn't really make sense. We see her, we see uh, her getting tied to a rock and dropped in the river. Yeah, it seems like a bad way to go. Um, I'm sure. Yeah. So they talk about how one thing that briefly mentioned of why 
So the uh, the movie tries to make a case mm -hmm. slightly about how, why Keyshawn is wrong. Mm -hmm. Is that like, oh, if Lin Zishu had just been allowed to do what he wants to do, they would have won. Yeah. But I don't I know don't, what... You don't think that, that would have been I the don't case. know what that would have been. So the yeah. one thing to talk about is like there were civil militias and then Keyshawn disbanded them. Yeah, Lin Zishu was trying to, you know... But... Um, from what I read, mm -hmm. they were like completely worthless. Yeah. And so like, I don't know. I, I don't think it would have been any difference if, if Lin's issue had been organizing the defense as Keyshawn, right? Mm -hmm. Neither of them are military guys. So in the end, the, the emperor and everybody descends. They, we're going to send all the troops. We're going to fight them. We're not going to give them Hong Kong. We're not mm -hmm. going to do this deal. Yeah. Uh, and then we get this then battle. We're going to fight. We yeah. get this battle scene for the last like 15 minutes of... Yeah. Everybody fighting and the British storming the things and the, the Chinese general blowing himself up rather than mm -hmm. be taken and yeah. um, et cetera, et cetera. And in the end, it ends with Kishan is now replaced by Yishan, who's another <laughs> Manchu guy. Yes. Uh, Kishan gets sentenced to death. Lin gets sentenced to exile. Yeah. I don't did think he they... get sentenced to death in the movie? Oh, I think he did. But like... In reality, both of them got pardoned. Yeah. Uh, later, on. neither of them actually died. Yeah. Died or got permanently exiled. Yeah, but there was the uh, uh, if you were going to talk about it. Yeah, I want to talk about the scene. The speech. Uh, the, so when uh, uh, Lin Zexu and Qi Shan are saying goodbye to each other. Yeah. <laughs> to um, dishonored, you know, <laughs> government officials now being sent on their ways, facing their own fate, um, and then Qi Shan goes, Lin Zexu, even though we were both, you know, we were both. Um, we both lost our jobs. Yeah. To, and the emperor's mad at both of us. But the way you go down in history is different than the way I will go down in history. Which is, yeah, this is what people say to people. The way I would go, like, as if that conversation could yeah. ever really happen. And he goes, you know, even if you lost, but you, your, your, your story has glory. You went it. down fighting. You went down fighting. And me, I'm going to be like the center of the history. I'm going to be a collaborator. Yeah. And I feel like as a Chinese audience, I will be like, yeah, I want to be Lin Zexu. I don't want to be Qi Shan. <laughs> you know, I want to. I want to have a hardline government. I want to support this government. You know, yeah. and I want to. You know, I. I just. You know, I want to have a supposedly this backbone of a nationalism mm -hmm. with me, rather than you know, and and it's not the story is never to collaborate or, or work with the foreigners. Yeah, is to like we have to work on ourselves. We have to stand up as a nation. Yeah. So again, choose nationalism. <laughs> yeah. Choose ha hardline la nationalism. And even if you will die or if you will lose temporarily, your name will go down in history the right way. I guess, I guess uh, Kishan is going to see the emperor before he gets executed. Mm -hmm. So Lin Zishu gives him a, a globe. Yeah. And he says he gives, him, <laughs> he gives him a globe. And he's like, the world is a lot bigger yeah. than I thought it was. I was a frog sitting in the bottom yeah, of, a, of, a, of, a well. of a well. There's so many countries out there. Yeah. And, you know, China's not that big in comparison. Yeah. So give this to the emperor and explain to him, you know, like why we can't just be the, the middle kingdom, right? We have yeah. to get stronger. Um, and so I guess... Movie <laughs> ends. Movie ends. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, I think it's, it's not at its core in mm -hmm. the events. It's not like, I don't know. It's not, a, it's not like a fabrication, right? It, it's oh, the overall kind of story beats are correct. Mm -hmm. Charles Elliott gets done dirty. But other than that, I feel like most of the characters get treated okay. Mm -hmm. And it is, I think, a good movie if you want to see, I don't know, if you want to see a sets of the Canton factories and the opium destruction. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know. There's lots of, there's lots of, uh, I'm assuming it's the same ship a bunch of times, but like <laughs> this British ship with his cannons yeah. shooting. Um, I, don't, I don't know what set ship they use for the movie, but. You can always skip the first parts and then if you want to get to the war details part uh, yeah yeah um but yeah the first like first 40 minutes is a, l is a little slow especially mm -hmm. if you don't know anything about yeah. the events so i don't know i think we've said everything i think so well i do want to add a little story yeah. at the end you know, remember the part where the uh the general who was not hooked on opium right mm -hmm. and he and he died basically like a suicide bomber yeah, all the British, the British had the taken war. the fort, yeah. and he's sitting on a cannon. He's yeah. like, our cannons don't even reach them. Yeah. So um, so that general, Guan Tianbei, like, do you remember there was a scene that he was asking a, basically like a house servant of his that has followed him all these years yeah. to just go back home to the, you know, to the, yeah. to the, to the, 
hometown. I almost thought He's that like, was supposed to be like his today. secret lover or something. No, it's well, no, it's so actually <laughs> that is like he had this uh, house, you know, servant that has been with him for a long time, mm-hmm. and after he had died, the day after the human the battle, mm-hmm. that's when he actually died in history, and um, and he didn't. It wasn't a suicide <laughs> bummer situation, <laughs> but you know he fought as brave as he could, yeah. given the difference in technological advances. <laughs> yeah. um, so he, um, the next day, his slave uh, held a white flag to the location where he had died, to the battle mm-hmm. location, and um, asked the British, who was ta- you know, who's, you know, already cleaning up yeah. the scene, um, if he could take the body. Oh, that's actually in one, of the, in one of the journals I read. Yeah, no, it was, a, it was recording a British journal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was recording in China's site as well, but... Um, so he and they they had to they already buried the bodies though yeah they, you know so they had to dig out the body for him to recognize whoever his master was yeah and take the body and then when he took the body away the British uh, war battle they were they shoot the cannons as a sort of a ceremonial yeah re- in respect and a salute yeah yeah and a salute and saying that this was a brave enemy and we got to show respect well, I think a lot of the man the, a lot of the mandarins just ran. Oh, I know, but like, you know, this general <laughs> yeah, didn't. And yeah. so, so they were some brave enemies, yeah, right? Yeah. So I felt like, obviously, that's not a convenient truth yeah. for the narrative of nationalism, mm-hmm. right? But there is some humanity in this situation. Oh, yeah. The, the house slave, right? not the slave, sorry. The house servant, yeah. basically the one I said. Yeah. The house servant. I mean, they're kind of, you know, the, he kind of owns the person. Yeah. Well, whenever you address a like a, a imperial official, you have to say your slave. Yeah, so. your slave me, who you know, yeah. and I'm kneeling down uh, in front of you, anyways. Yeah. But you know, the 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 servant, the house servant, right? The the good buddy, the mm-hmm. old buddy. Uh, he, you know, he didn't. He went back with a little white flag yeah. to get the body so he can bury him at the hometown, you know. And then the British let him do it, help him do it. Yeah. And showed, you know, saluted, and I just feel like there is some humanity. In this very terrible story, well, there's of this, many people have died and many lives lost. Well, there's this. Um, this is more about the last episode, but there is this creeping anger mm-hmm. that appears on the British side. Yeah. Because at the start, Charles Elliot. Yeah. They take they take the 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 Qing officials' word mm-hmm. when they're like, "Okay, we're gonna negotiate. We need a week to get back and and get from the emperor." Yeah. And and so they take their word for it at first, mm-hmm. and then eventually. There's this sort of like, I mean, obviously they're there to do a war, mm-hmm. so, but like, you know, there is a bit of, I don't know, there's no, there's no Geneva convention yet, but there no. is a bit, there is a bit of give and take where it's like, yeah. okay, we'll treat you honorably to yeah. this extent if you treat us. Yeah. And there is this extent of like, okay, every single time they, they, they negotiate or say they're going to do something, they don't do it. Mm-hmm. And eventually there's this, the war kind of becomes more brutal because they kind of stop. Yeah. Caring. Caring. Yeah. yeah. But this was, I think this is the early stages of the war. Yeah, right. Right. And I don't know, obviously, so like, you know, Chinese people have strong feelings about this movie. Yeah. Good and bad. But um, the, the, the scene of this general, how he died. Yeah. Right. The suicide. It's almost, some people didn't like it because it's almost like it's, it's glorifying, right? This, this idea of like, kill yourself and bring the, cus- uh, bring the, bring the, um, the enemy down with you yeah. by all means regardless whether it's a hopeless war or it's a, you know, a pointless war or not. Yeah. And they're glorifying this fictional plot mm-hmm. of his, right? And, and it's just, it's, of course, very, again, very convenient for the narrative. Yeah. And I think, um, well, one thing else that I just thought interesting about the battle scene mm-hmm. was like, you never see Chinese troops with guns. You see them with cannons, no. but you never see them with... But they did have guns. They they did have guns. Yeah. They I mean Chinese people. But that's invent, not convenient. Invented gunpowder. Yeah. Um. They had you know probably a third of the guys would have guns. Yeah. And um. Yeah. But how you know, would you show them fighting bravely, even though there's such uh, a drastic uh, difference in between? You know. I know. And they it doesn't it also doesn't show that people just ran away sometimes. <laughs> yeah. A lot of the times they ran away. Yeah. Um, but the first battle because mm-hmm. we only really see the first battle in this. Yeah. The first battle. There was a lot less running away, mm-hmm. and there is that, that. There can be that kind of effect where if you put all the bravest people in the in the on the front line, mm-hmm. and they uh, all die, they all day die. One. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> then that means each 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 other battle you fight, you have yeah. less and less of those people left. Yeah, because they all get killed each time. Yeah, um, and the people who run away are all you have left. Yes. Um, What's the lesson? War is terrible. Yeah. Well, 
don't get involved in a drug war. Yes. Um, well, anyway, hopefully that was interesting to people. I think, yeah, if you just search for it on YouTube or other places, you can find it. Um, it's, it's interesting as, a, as an artifact and also, I think, to watch and kind of ponder what the Communist Party wanted people to get from each kind of scene and interaction. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only problem is the translation is really bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess, yeah, if you're watching it and you have questions... Yeah, feel free to uh, yeah, write to us, message I'll translate us, email for you. <laughs> us or on Twitter or something and yeah. we can we can tell you what it is. I was watching and I did not understand what was happening in that uh, the scene where he's waiting for everybody to go through opium withdrawals. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're like, what, I was what like, are they doing? I was this like, is... he's just bringing them in here and he's just kind of staring at them. Yeah. I'm like, why are they falling over? Like, yeah. are they just too ashamed? <laughs> and then like, oh. Yeah, they're too ashamed for their like, addition, addiction Jerry, of opium. Like, no, no, they're, they're, it's opium yeah. withdrawals. Like, you have to have it every couple hours. And I was like, yeah. oh, okay, I get it now. <laughs> yeah. Um, which was actually a thing, though. They, um, well, uh, opium withdrawals was, was a thing? Well, it was starting to become a problem. Like, you would have a... Um, oh, the imperial exam. Yeah, you have an imperial exam, and you have the, you know, the exam takes, like, two days. <laughs> yeah. And people start going through opium withdrawals opium, while they're yeah. taking the exam. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Well, okay. Uh, I think we, ha- we have an exciting non-opium related episode coming up next week. Yeah. We're going to talk about the celebrated cases of Judge D. Um, so please look forward to that. Take a small break from this doom and gloom yeah, opium war topic. Drug shenanigans. For many episodes. So thank you for listening and have a nice day. See you next time.